just uh, it's my great pleasure, which I don't want to be stolen from me, to introduce uh, Stephanie Nezrenga. Welcome. Today she is strategy lead at Fundi Workshops, and uh, you have a background in uh, uh, industry research, uh, business strategy, financial analysis, and investor outreach, especially in East and South and Africa, and you were, as far as I know, very active uh, for a mobile tech venture, and before that uh, in the startup scene, as far as I know, maybe we'll hear about that later. Um, I try not to spoil too much, but I uh, allow myself to speak a bit about Fundi. Uh, please throw something at uh, my direction if I'm spoiling uh, important facts. Uh, Fundi, this is uh, what I learned from a paper written by Juliet Van Yeri, who is the founder of Fundi Workshops. Uh, the, the term Fundi comes from the Swahili word Fundi with you, uh, which refers to um, a wider sense to the term of maker, of artisan, of craftsman or tinkerer, one could say. Um, but Fundi Workshop is not, not necessarily only a fab lab as, as we know it, and Andres might relate to that later today. Um, its mission is rather, it, um, reminds me of uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss concept of uh, bricolage, or the bricoleur as the ever curious inventor using material available um, for individual problem solving. That's my um, perspective on it. Um, Fundi Workshops is um, active in that's a rather difficult question, try to figure out where you are based. Um, that's not easy. You're active in Kenya, uh, Uganda, Burundi, um, but I, I'm not sure where it's actually based in a physical way. So when Yvette and Julia mentioned um, we are based where the network is, that's a similar case for Fundi, I guess. Um, but Fundi has also been a guest at uh, occasions such as the FabLearn conference in 2015 at Stanford uh, Graduate School of Education, or uh, two times, I think, at the Berlin Republica in 2015 and 16. Um, I think from the 2016, there is an interview given by Juliet um, where she's describing the workshops uh, you are doing as an approach to, I quote, teaching people how to have that entry feeling into the world of electronics. Um, and uh, in her paper that I mentioned earlier with the strong title, Democratizing Technology in Africa, um, she wrote, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. And uh, she continues, a strong foundation of innovation has formed from the constraints uh, that creators must face when solving a problem. So the constraints by the limited access to technology is still turned around into uh, a potential space, maybe. Uh, in many parts of Africa, access to CNC machinery is limited. Um, some areas are uh, without power supply. Um, this is why Fundi is focusing on creating uh, the technological preconditions, one might say, by developing open source uh, and low-cost technology-based solutions um, with uh, strategies of recycling, upcycling, and use of locally available materials. I have much more prepared, but I will stop now because I'm, I think I'm already spoiling your presentation. Um, but I'm looking forward to discussion afterwards. Uh, Stephanie, please. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the kind introduction. Uh, you are spoiling my presentation, but <laughs> it's, it's no problem. Um, so, <laughs> uh, as Daniel mentioned, I am Stephanie, and I work with Juliet on Fundi workshops. So, uh, I can give a bit of a background on what Fundi is and what Fundi actually means. So. Being in Germany, everyone is just speaking in German, and um, a few things are hard to identify. So for this session, I will give you a bit of Swahili. So this quote says that penye mafundi hapakosi wanafunzi. So that basically means that where there are craftsmen, there will be no lack of learners. Essentially, what we are saying is that People who build, who create, are perpetually learning in the process. Um, so that is what Fundi is all about, uh, creating but learning in the process. 
So as, as Daniel mentioned, uh, fundi actually means maker. So in Kenya in particular and in Africa, um, across Africa, what happens is that uh, people who are involved in the grimy nature of building products are identified as fundis. And you find that not many people actually want to partake in that just because of that grimy nature. And the truth of the matter is that even creators who build very high tech uh, technology, such as um, the one on the right, yeah, far right, um, are still fundis, are still creators. So the idea is to uplift the name fundi so that anyone who is a creator can feel like their contribution is actually worth it. So our fundi version, which is F O N. DI is just an adaptation of the word fundi so that if you hear someone in uh, Kenya or in Africa being called a fundi, you can associate it with something positive, right? Um, a creator, an innovator. So Juliet is basically uh, an electrical engineer and what happens in the African let me say Kenyan context, is that during your studies, especially your university studies, your work is very technical based. Um, so you learn a lot of, sorry, not technical, but theoretical based. So you go to class and you're touched a bunch of things and then you leave. Um, and you feel a slight disconnect with that. So the idea here was to make learning sessions very interactive. Um, and engineers, for example, in Kenya, you leave the classroom, but you really don't know how to build anything. You just know that this machine is for product X, or um, this is how to build product Y, but you've never actually really done it. So what we do at Fundi is that we use collaborative design workshops with the aim of capacity building and skills sharing. And the idea is to create that platform, that space, you would say, where students can actually problem set and design and prototype and basically engage in entrepreneurial uh, ventures. So the idea is to work with youth uh, so that they don't feel uh, very constrained to just find employment. The idea is to spur them to be innovators such that when they go out there, they don't have to really look for employment, although that's perfectly fine if that's what they want, but they can sit and actually create something with the skills that they have. So we are, uh, Okay, technically we are based in Kenya, uh, but we have done workshops within other East African countries, so Uganda and Burundi. So for now, I will just talk about a few of the workshops that we've actually done. So in Kenya, just uh, last year alone, we did over 10 workshops, and the idea is to integrate hardware and software in building technology. So within Africa, within East Africa, there's been a very big tech boom, basically, and it's more oriented to software than hardware. And we were looking to create that shift such that, okay, you have the software, but can we have people within Africa actually building products that can be integrated with that software just to create and just spur that development within our communities? And uh, one of the workshops that we first did, the very, very first one, was a Bicey Blender. So here, we were looking to um, basically blend products as you ride your bicycle, right? And the, the session was very interactive. It was about, okay, how can we build a product X, product Y? And uh, we saw that there was a very keen interest just in getting those hands-on uh, learning experience. Then we thought, okay, I'm building a Bicey Blender, but what are the chances that they'll actually be used that often? I mean, it, it's innovative, it's very creative, but how many people will be riding bikes and just going blending their food at the back. Um, so we saw a, a type of evolution there, right? So shifting and saying, okay, you can build amazing products, but how can you build them with a local context in mind so that you solve solutions for the communities where you're actually based? So one uh, workshop that we did thereafter 
was about uh, smart healthcare. Right? So we had a bunch of students who came in and they were looking, we were teaching them the process of design thinking and how to basically create smartware technologies. So we would have them in groups, uh, they would sit, they would uh, ideate, uh, go back and forth, interact with each other and see what products can be made from there. Right? So the, uh, the main concept we are using is design thinking. So first setting your problem up and then uh, iterate, creating what the solution would be and then iterating from that continuously to make something that's actually feasible. So one of the end products here was actually a smart bra. So this smart bra would basically detect your vitals um, and be able to, to see what kind of mood you're in and then send you um, uplifting messages if maybe you're, you're not feeling very well um, and such like things. Um, and what we saw actually just the other day is that there was this major fashion event um, yeah, somewhere in America or Europe, where they also had a smart bra, but in this case, the smart bra was was to make, like to cool the body. So in an essence, you find, okay, our students are in the right direction, and the idea is just to build up on those ideas that they have. So in as much as there's this smart bra that's being publicized um, across America or Europe, um, we can also, do and create and build amazing things uh, that can be taken to the next level. So that's in Kenya. Uh, Kenya is where we're based, so that's where most of the workshops are. Uh, but we've also done work in Uganda and Burundi. So in Uganda, we have boda bodas. So a boda boda is a motorcycle, and they are used heavily, heavily uh, to transport uh, people from one place to another. But in Uganda as well, there's issues of power such that there are areas that do not get access to electricity for some time. And with the mobile, uh, with the mobile boom within um, Africa, you find that many people have phones, but your phone tends to die, right? And what can you do about that? So here, uh, the students that we were working with built a product, uh, basically a charger that can uh, be like can charge your phone as the Boda Boda is being driven. So the Boda Boda is, is basically like a job. It's like a taxi, right? And these people are perpetually moving around. So if they have the opportunity to also charge someone's phone and earn money from that, hey, it's, it's all good and <laughs> it's completely acceptable. So the students here actually built this product and they were happy with it and they were like, yeah, in fact, we'll go and start selling these things across, across town. And uh, they were really happy that at the end of the day, the charger actually worked. Um, and, and that's the, the spark that we like to see, the, the empowerment that they feel like, hey, we can actually build these products and the process of d designing, sorry, designing is actually a process. It's not just a one-off thing. You just don't design BAM. Designing is creating that, uh, identifying that problem, creating that solution, iterate, iterating and making it uh, an essentially uh, an amazing product in the end. Um, then in Burundi, uh, we were working with uh, women uh, at Akila Institute. And there, the main problem was that they find it hard to commute to, to school. So it was a case of, okay, so what are you going to do about it? So we are posing the question back to them so that they can find the solution. It's a process of guiding as opposed to just giving you the answer. Um, and here they came up with a product where they were able, it's like, it's like an Uber, um, but for school. Um, so that's, that's the design challenge and that's the solution they came up with. Um, so this is all um, well and good, <laughs> but we do have certain guiding principles that um, basically keep us motivated even as a company. So 
For us, we are interested in three things. We are interested in skills building, uh, network expansion, and community development. Skills building, as I mentioned, uh, it's integrating the hardware with the software. So having that content open source so that the students can actually know where to get this information and build up on it. And it's, it's very informal. It, it doesn't have to be very um, structured in a sense. And then um, teaching them that whole process, as I mentioned, of design thinking, critical thinking, problem solving. Then the next piece is network expansion. So when you have a group of people and you are together and you get to express ideas, even at as is happening now, you basically expand your view or your understanding of things, which is always an amazing thing. So in that sense, students can get to know more, can get to see, okay, I have this idea, but how can I integrate it with uh, another person's idea to make it even better? Um, and then mentorship uh, partnerships. So as you're looking to grow, it's always uh, helpful uh, or appreciated to have someone who was there uh, or is there and they can actually guide you in your process. So having that platform where we can also provide that mentorship opportunity or we can link people up to mentorship opportunities is, is also something we are very interested in. But uh, at the heart of everything, it's about community development. So empowering the youth, but empowering them to build their communities. Um, so from all this, we've learned actually quite a bit. Um, and one of the the key things that we've learned is workshops are great, but if they're done once a year, as mentioned, or once every six months, hey, <laughs> like there's nothing much there. You find people come and they go and they continue living their lives basically almost untouched. Um, and our students were very keen uh, on having that continuity, which is something that we also want to to perpetuate basically. And what we are looking now to do is we have a partner uh, called Fundi Mekat, I mean, sorry, Mekatilili program. And she runs these skills sharing projects, but with high school students, right? So we are preaching a lot about collaboration. Not everything has to be a competition. You can have co collaboration. So coming together with Mekatilili, the Mekatilili program, to actually have an Africa Maker program where you have students learning for a longer duration of time just so that they can really uh, grow their skills in the sense that it's fine to get the basics, but you want to build more on that, right? So how can you actually do that within a longer period of time? And it's one thing to build a house, like to know the foundation of building a house, but it's, it's another thing to actually be able to build from the bottom up and have this amazing structure already at hand. Um, so the Africa Makeup Program is uh, where our future is, is looking, where we'll work with students for a longer period of time, about a month, and we'll teach them about uh, design, about prototyping, programming, and about business and soft skills so they can actually be able to venture forth and do amazing things. Um, so that's it from us. Uh, thanks, thanks, very exciting. Um, maybe first question from me directly to you. Are there any, um, of course, there are success stories, but are there any success stories you, are, um, you want to underline, you are especially proud of? Like, I, I read that there were actually coming business models from the Boda Boda project, so um, former students of you running um, uh, uh, businesses in this direction now. Do you have any success stories to tell? Um, yeah, thanks. So, yes, uh, the the main one is actually the one for the Boda Boda in Uganda because it's something that they could pick up on immediately and start actually monetizing uh, for the growth, for their growth. Uh, but as I mentioned, it it's one thing to have a, a workshop where you're doing something one-off and what we're looking to do is create that perpetuity so that we can even track how our students are like growing, how they are moving beyond that. 
so you would meet with them later on. And, no. Any reactions or direct questions? What, uh, who, what, do you have an organization behind you? Like, uh, or is it self-organized? Um, so we work a lot with uh, Stanford. So Juliet is a Stanford fellow, a Stanford Fablan fellow. So we have uh, mentors from them. We also have mentors from a program called the International Development Design Summit. So they also support us financially. We've applied for grants in that way. Uh, but uh, in terms of financial uh, aspects, we fund the project ourselves as well as look for grant funding from organizations like IDDS and and USAID, yeah. Um, do you have, I mean, you just showed us that you are working with partners in collaboration at um, institutions as partners. Do you also collaborate with um, institutions in academia, let's say the Makere University in Kampala, um, and they have a college for arts, design, technology, uh, as far as I know, or do you, con do you consider yourself outside of the classical academia education? Um, Currently, we are a bit outside of the traditional academia, but we are looking at a partnership with uh, one of the leading universities in Kenya. And the idea is to tap into their network such that we will be running the program, keeping it as, as we see very interactive and very social and very uh, youth oriented, uh, but they would be providing um, resources such as a space um, and, and marketing and such like things. So the idea is that we feel that our curr curriculum is very uh, niche in, in that perspective and we want to keep it that way. Um, so the, the partnership that we've, we're seeking out currently with uh, the leading, one of the leading universities is aimed at that uh, sharing of uh, resources. Thank you. Yvette, uh, Julia, maybe since you're doing workshops uh, too in a quite different field. Um, but I had to, to think about Funi when you were presenting because um, you were talking about workshops that are exactly, have a similar idea of sustainability and mentoring afterwards, so not going only there, giving the workshop and leaving. Mm. So from, at least for me, there seem to be uh, quite a lot of parallels in the structure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I was just talking to Yvette, like, oh, we have to team up with you. <laughs> no, and um, maybe we, um, what we did in terms of our workshops, our approach was always um, um, uh, quite egoistic one, not a like educational ones. We go there and, you know, help the youngsters become proper art critics from a Western, you know, point of view or perspective, but more um, egoistic in the sense that we needed, um, yeah, critics all over the place, you know, in cities, you know, from Bamako to Lagos. And of course, in cities such as Lagos or Joburg, you have a lot of critics, such as in Berlin, maybe many, maybe not as many, but many. But, you know, in Harare or, you know, Bam Bamako, it gets tougher yeah, in terms of um, art critics. Um, and that's why we thought uh, it's an egoistic thing, because we need writers, so we have to get them somehow, <laughs> some, yeah. And that's why we started with the workshops. It's not egoistic, it's reciprocity, I, I guess. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. Oh. I was gonna say the same thing, actually. Yeah. There's the question, actually. Right in the back. Hi, uh, I have a question related to the presentation of this morning, this manifesto we read, um, and it's a question for all of you. Uh, do you think um, the, the Africa you described today could be a place where um, open source could be a relevant and the normal, uh, the normality and not a niche as it happened uh, here in Europe, which, or, or do you think it's gonna be cannibalized as well as the big money is coming in? <clears throat> so, I think um, in 
Africa, it's it's very much going to be um, it's not going to be cannibalized as has happened with Europe. So we are very much into sharing um, the information and, and how we see that makes sense is through open source. So actually getting people onto those platforms is what we're, we're actually looking to do right now. Good, any further questions? Um, maybe a provocation at the end. I, I brought a quote um, which I digged up from a blurb um, of a book by um, Jake Bright and Aubrey Ruby. Um, it's entitled The Next Africa An Emerging Continent Becomes a Global Powerhouse. And it uh, won certain business books awards I don't know about, but it did. And it says, the next Africa describes the future of a more globally connected Africa where its leaders and citizens wield significant economic, cultural, and political power. A future in which Americans will be more likely to own African stocks, work for companies doing businesses in Africa, buy African hits from iTunes, see Nigerian actors win Oscars, and learn new African names connected to tech, moguls, and billionaires. For me, that's a very a quite obvious projection of Western value um, to the African continent, which is, as you already uh, told us today, already a very vague uh, localization, the African continent. Um, are you, I, that's, that's a very odd uh, blurb for a book, in my perspective. Are you confronted with similar perspectives in your work, too? That's a question for all of us. So the, the, uh, export of Western values uh, to a continent that is now ready to embrace the Western value. It, um, it opposite to developing an own identity, an own right. um, personal, private, or local identity, maybe. Um, well, I think for me, um, this is nothing new. It's already happening, and it's been happening. There's, there never. I don't think there has ever been a separation of the Western and the African. I mean, this is through colonialism, post-colonialism. I mean, it's always been interconnected, really. And I think what, like, how I envisage of the future of Africa would be if we could start own our own um, content, if I may say so. And I'm talking here uh, from the artistic point of view, film point of view, because so far we don't. and. Um, what that would be a step into the future where we create, own, and then take our own out for the for the others to consume, you know. And I think this this would be a success story when we can also really profit 100% of our um, artistic practices. Yeah, um, uh, I agree, and maybe also just talking from the more visual art perspective, because it's something kind of connected to the blurb that people often ask us, you know, there are no museums in Africa, and what can we do, or what should happen, or like, it's also this kind of projection that this is a su success if you have like a big museum, like the one that's opening in Cape Town now this year in September, but actually, um, it's really more, it's like similar to say, okay, there are actually other things happening. It doesn't have to be the museum to say that you have like a successful art scene in a place because there are also a lot of alternatives, spaces or um, pop-up things or whatever that are their own definitions that have been also happening already for a while. So it's also not something that's just happening. And I think this is something that maybe applies on a broader sense that it really, there is a lot of stuff happening already for a while, but it's just it can't, it doesn't always work this way, that you can just apply it, like just to say, like the Western values and say, if it's not there, then there is necessarily a problem uh, in that sense. And I think that's very much true also in, in the arts, in the arts field in, this, in a way. And I also think it is also already successful because there is a lot of things being generated and it gets attention that is coming from within and it's not implemented. Um, from from outside, I think, and I think it's the same. Ghana is like a really good example, but also in other contexts that a lot of people are actually, you know, moving back or like studying abroad and then go back um, to build up structures um, in a way how they feel that they make sense 
in the specific local um, context. And so I don't think there's like a solution in that sense that you can say, you know, you have these goals and once they're achieved, then it's like, check, it's done. It's just not, I don't think it's working that way. And as far as I understood it, it's similar with Fundi when I understood um, some of your text, right? That it's not only about um, creating own tech solutions, but also building up really tech ventures and to spread the, the inventions out to the world in, in, the, in the long run. That's that's how I understood it. Um, yeah, so even just to, to build up on what Jackie said, uh, creating and then uh, being the people who use it, basically, um, a challenge that we've actually seen is that you find there is that African product, but people do not, the local people do not want to purchase it. Maybe they find that um, something more uh, popular or like more like branded um, as opposed to locally made is suddenly better. So there is that need to shift even people's mindsets so that they know that, okay, this is, uh, it's an African product or um, et cetera, and it, it's good, right? Promote yourself first. Um, so it's not enough for us to build products and then they go to, to Western um, areas. Um, it's really important for us to also foster the use of our own products within our own communities. So engaging, engaging with the technology also changes your attitude towards technology, not to see it as a product you consume, but you you are you into it. I mean, I think we will hear about that uh, in the evening by Julian Oliver quite a lot. But well, the role of digitalization is, isn't it? Well, it brings African countries also to in well, it's a leap into the future. So you can it's it's also isn't it also a possibility to uh, surpass industri industrial industrialization, for instance, for uh, for the um, agriculture. Uh, new devices which are developed in in, uh, in uh, startups, for instance, in Nairobi, help to um, well to individualize solutions for uh, agricultural um, fields. So it's, um, it's it's perhaps something which also is um, part of of your workshops. You you will uh, will guide. So it's and also for for you. Uh, also for your platform, I think uh, digitalization is uh, well. It's uh, it's the uh, so important that it's a digital platform, and, uh, and you are not linked only to print. No, yeah, so that of course was one of the main <coughs> motivations to um, have the you know to be as open and ex as accessible as possible, and um, we. Um, um, responded website as well was which was pos uh, important because um, you know many many people you know in countries such as I don't know in Kenya or or Lagos would you know all have smartphones you know more than you know everybody in Berlin and all together has so um, and they do a lot of stuff on their smartphones you know from banking stuff to reading contemporary and so. Um, that was very important to us to have, of course, to be online and to have a responsive website so that it works on all kind of tablets um, which are used, you know, uh, in Africa. Um, sorry, as the... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to say that this, I mean, the notion of digitalization and, um, well, the whole practice of digitalization is not something that is just uh, important to the people living on the continent, but this is, I think, a global um, solution, you know, I mean, even in Germany or in England, in America, I mean, this is the kind of time we're living in, so I, I just wanted to add that. Um, sorry, just... Uh actually spark conversation with my panelists. Um, a, a key thing even from uh, this morning's conversation has been open source, and even as um, a question from the crowd came up. And the, the sense that I get is that artists, um, like you're creating things, but you also need to, to make money from it. So creating that open source platform uh, 
why how how will artists be able to sustain their living if uh, the consumers can get access to their products for free right um there's also that creating value within your work such that you know i've made this amazing product and i know it should be worth for example 1 million right so how to move beyond just that yeah sorry i just it, i was biting my tongue all the time to to ask this question but your last question it, uh, sort of you know, put it on the on the agenda uh, how do you feel about the Chinese and Indian influence in Africa, actually, about the enormous investments, their occupation of national resources when it comes to mining, etc., and what effect does it actually has on African culture? So from our perspective, uh, kind of uh, perspective, of course, it has an impact. You know, um, museums are paid by Chinese, for example, or by uh, Koreans that are built, or cultural centers, etc. Um, yeah, it's a big question, you know, now, and hard to answer because, you know, in Sudan the influence is different than in, you know, or in, I don't know, Kenya, for example, but, um, yeah, the influence is there. Um, it's not always bad, you know, and it's, you know, it's too easy to say, oh, this is uh, new colonialism, and it's, um, uh, not easy to say it's all good, but um, of course um, there is influence. And um, yeah, you want to say something? Oh, no, I, I, I thought, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, like in the artistic field, is something like lots of artists also start to actually deal with it mm. uh, as a topic in a way, but also the other way around. I mean, I just talked the other day to an academic. Um, I think she, I'm not sure where she's based, but where they actively actually invite also artists from Africa to China, um, to art schools and so on, um, in a way to say, okay, it, it's time to have this kind of connection on that level also. So not in the sense that then, you know, um, inviting them just to fund, but just to, because she said it's like really important that people, you know, if they all have families moving to Africa, that they get a better sense of what's happening. Um, but also, I, yeah, as I just said, I think it really depends also where you are and where how it's being perceived. Um, it's very different in Congo, for example, than yeah, in other places. So it really depends also. Um, yeah. So in terms of like building the actual products uh, in themselves, um, it's it's true. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, um, but there are situations where it can be uh, grossly now expatriated, like almost everything is expatriated, which is what we are trying to move away from. So in as much as we do have uh, the expatriate world coming in and, and creating those products and, and doing these amazing things, what's important there is to transfer those skills now to the local community so that even as uh, the expatriates leave the country because they have finished their product, the locals have the skills and uh, the knowledge to actually do that for themselves beyond beyond just that one project. I mean, uh, if I may, um, to go back to this uh, question about digitization, um, uh, and I hope I'm I'm not too trivial in in my question or in my remark. Um, you mentioned Edouard Lisson. Um, I had the pleasure to meet him at the beginning of the 1990s. And uh, this was a big conference in, in Berlin at the uh, HKW, um, HKW. Um, and uh, he was invited because this was the beginning of the internet. Why did they invite Edouard Lisson? Um, because of his wonderful idea about poetics of relation. Um, it was, of course, a big misunderstanding between the organizers of the conference and uh, Glisson, because he made very clear that his idea of poetics of relation has nothing to do with this technological idea of creating something like the Internet. Um, but, of course, there is a, um, a, um, a, um, a connection. Um, one could uh, provocatively say uh, that uh, in uh, Glissant's idea and in the idea of the Caribbean islands and connecting the different cultures, um, there is an avant-garde project uh, which was 
more avant-garde than the technological solution which came later. What do you think about this thesis? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely interesting, and I, I, I would actually agree with that. It's also an, uh, hmm, yeah. Let me think about it a bit more. But um, so, just so I understand correctly, so you want to, um, the, the statement is basically that his ideas, that his avant-garde ideas, could be seen. Um, as a, a technological advancement too, like, uh, is that what you... Yeah, they are more progressed than the technological realization uh, of uh, a related uh, global society. Or mm. <coughs> and how was the reaction? Uh, so how was the reaction when, you know, when it kind of... <laughs> <laughs> but in the end they agreed um, on this well, I mean, crazy thesis. Or at least saw ah. this is impossible. He was yes. the most beautiful poet uh, in the yes, world yeah. and, and one of the strongest uh, philosoph philosophical thinkers. So, of course, um, there was not much disagreement, mm. uh, but a lot of thinking right at the beginning of the internet culture about this idea what is progress and yeah. what is communication in the future, what is relations in the future. Yeah, yeah. For you, this is all self evident because you grew up with all this material already. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> It's a bit like this um, quote at the beginning, the contemporary comes before the modernity. Yeah, this is, yes. yeah. <coughs> I want to ask about the museum in Cape Town. I think that's the one that uh, a German, actually a German collector, a collector is building. He has a big farm in Namibia, mm -hmm. isn't it? And um, Jochen Zeitz is his name, yes. Yes, exactly, from um, the Puma, the ex Mannheim, I think. Yes originally. Anyway, mm. uh, I think these are kind of very interesting points because he's kind of building a, a more or less traditional museum um, and um, and therefore I would argue that the question is more not about is this art or where is art, it's more the, the question what is progressive in the cultural realm and uh, where should kind of also where should we interfere or where should we try to reorganize what is thought to be a museum in a specific context? Uh, even especially if you think that, especially in Cape Town, Chimorenga was active for a very long time already, kind of this um, newspaper platform. Um. I'm not exactly sure was it whether that was more a comment or a question, but um, <laughs> it was more a comment on uh, that I really think it's uh, more a question how to join forces to do something progressive yeah. in the arts or in the cultural no, field. No, I agree. And I think um, coming back to that museum, it's maybe also interesting to know that um, in the, let's say, Euro-American art context, the museum is regarded as something, a huge deal. It's, um, there are a lot of reviews already. It's a very positive thing. People start a asking us about it. But actually, in Cape Town and South Africa, uh, the local art scene has a huge problem with it, um, which I think is often the thing that happens, that there are still also these different kinds of perceptions. Um, and so, because the problem maybe to explain is for many South Africans is that um, not only that he comes in building that museum, but also in a way how it kind of claims to be the museum of African contemporary art, and but at uh, the same time, of course, excluding um, a lot of positions, and which is generally not a problem if it would be more uh, like a private initiative in a way that he would say, okay, it's like his private collection that he's showing, but it's kind of trying to make this claim of being the museum on the continent for, for contemporary art. And it's interesting to see how they're like, despite all the relations we have in the internet, there's still very different kinds of perceptions um, wherever you're actually currently based in which, in which context. So. Well, if there is no further question, I would suggest we are closing the session for now. Thanks a lot um, for coming and thanks a lot for uh, to you for uh, giving the out of the art world's perspective um, that was brave and necessary, I think. 
and um, I will hand over the microphone to Andrea Bodensieg in a second, but I uh, would like to remind you on the evening program starting at uh, 7, I think, um, with uh, Julian Oliver, a critical engineer and artist um, with a performance lecture and intervention. Not here, but as uh, always when you're doing our evening program during this conference, it will be at the big studio where the conference opened yesterday, so don't miss it. <laughs> 